Hello, everybody. Today, I'm excited to welcome Chris Dreyer uh, of Rankings.io, who is an SEO specialist. Welcome, Chris, to the show. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yay. Excellent. So even though Chris, specifically through his business, Rankings.io, serves personal injury lawyers, we're going to be digging into a lot of stuff just around SEO, around just some real stuff, real talk around the way you run your business. But before we get into that, Chris, I'd love to ask, what is your superpower in business and in the world? Geez, my superpower is getting things done, having the big vision, but then executing on it. And that means anything, any endeavor, it's just going, just executing, not being a ruminator or a wantrepreneur, being an entrepreneur. Ah, oh, heck to the, yeah, that I, I relate to that so hard. I feel like 80% of true entrepreneurhood is just doing stuff, not just talking about it. All right. And why does the world need what you do? We are the best SEO agency for personal injury attorneys, period, unquestioned. Ah, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So just the fact that you say that, you know, I have this really strong belief in marketing. Now I didn't make it up. I forget who I got it from that, uh, not just marketing, but in business that if you really want to thrive, you basically have to pick your personal mountain, like that thing that you can climb and be the best at and climb and be at the top of the mountain. And that's what I'm hearing you've done specifically for SEO for personal injury lawyers. And I think that's really awesome and specific, but I also think that a lot of people listening, maybe they're doing well in their business, but that level of kind of specificity and focus feels really terrifying. So I'm curious, you know, how did you pick this particular niche? Uh, kind of what was that journey like for you? Was it kind of obvious or did you kind of fish around? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that every decision that I've made, there's a certain level of, of data that was behind mm. the decision. So when I started at the very beginning, I wanted to specialize. I knew that it, the, the landscape was just completely saturated with tons of agencies. So I wanted to kind of pick my, you know, spot to, to kind of drive my stake into the ground and I picked legal. And at the beginning, I started off doing PPC SEO design. And to be honest, when I started, if you would have threw me any project, if it would have been social media, whatever, I probably would have done it. And just to kind of, you know, at the beginning, especially since I bootstrapped, I couldn't be too selective with what work I was taking in. I had to take on some of the clients that I didn't want to work with or some of the lower yeah. fee projects with those lower barrier entries, those shorter term contracts. And at the beginning, I, I offered those services. And at the end of three years, I looked at my P&L from the accountant and I saw, hey, we're doing pretty good in the SEO side, but we just weren't very profitable for PPC or design. Now, knowing what I know today, there are some actions or steps that I could have taken to make those other two areas profitable. Mm -hmm. But back then, it, it was a challenge to be to, for profitability. So what I ended up doing was I just completely referred out all the pay-per-click business. And my thought process was if, if I could send someone a pay-per-click lead, they could potentially reciprocate and send me SEO leads. So what I strategically did was I looked for pay-per-click only agencies, agencies that didn't offer SEO and tried to build a relationship with those. And I did, and that was very successful. Uh, and then a year later, kind of a similar situation. I always thought that design for, for myself was a loss leader. First, you sell a website and then you sell a marketing. But for us, everybody was coming for a website that were already existing SEO clients. Mm -hmm. And then we were selling these websites that weren't very profitable. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing was we, we got rid of design. We were just law firm SEO. And then I remember listening to a podcast by Seth Godin and we were talking about purple cow. And we were talking about, you know, building a remarkable agency. And it just kind of clicked with me that we serve personal injury attorneys very well. And I looked at it from a data perspective and I saw that 70% of our revenue was less than 40% of our clientele. Mm, that was just yeah, an easy decision. Yeah. <laughs> so we went all in for personal injury SEO and we ended up strategically referring out the rest of those leads. And that's kind of the journey now there's yeah. definitely, that sounds like, oh, that's all that went really smooth and perfect. There were definitely some mistakes along the way and uh, some things that I learned. It wasn't just a smooth process, but it ended up being the right decision for us. 
Fair enough, fair enough. And, and I'd love to kind of reflect and unpack on your journey. But first, I'm curious, you know, what were some of those mistakes that you found yourself falling into? Yeah, good first? question. Didn't think you'd get away from that, did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of them was just a lack of focus. So when we mm-hmm. went to law firm SEO and we were doing really well with that, mm-hmm. I was in a Vistage, which is like a mentor, like peer board where you get yeah. together every month with your peers and I did my business review and everyone's like, you should take your model and do physician SEO. You should do home services SEO. And I'm like, you're right. I should. I've got this down for lawyers. So I opened up and I got a couple physician clients. I got a couple home service clients. But what happened was the copy, it was a real challenge for the copywriting mm-hmm. and um, just understanding your avatar and kind of it just depowered my flywheel right? All this momentum, all this power in the legal vertical. And it's like, okay, let me stop that. And let me go to this home services or or physicians. And it just completely didn't work. Now there, again, there are some strategies I could have taken to continue to power that momentum, but it was a big learning lesson. And we, you know, we totally redid our website and had to change all the copy back. So that was costly. That was time uh, absorbed into that. One of the advantages of niching is you understand how to bring value to a particular area where you get a new prospect, you already automatically understand them, their wants, their desires, their goals. And since I was spreading out to more niches, it was like, I I had to discover that I had to do research and try to do this to try to figure that out every time. And every time was bespoke and kind of this iterative process that just led to inefficiencies and, and profit marketing, everything. Oh, yes. Uh, Chris, I, I'm just eating this up because so many things, I mean, you just shared the story of your journey, but I'm pulling so many key things out of here. And I, and I just want to kind of go back and uh, just highlight some of the things that are jumping out for me. Um, and one of them is, and you've repeated this several times, when you chose to focus, now you did make that decision based on data, you know, where the momentum was building, et cetera, but that's not to say that you were forced into that decision because there was nothing you could do in these other areas to shore it up. And I think that's actually, mm-hmm. that's one of the most powerful things that I'm hearing is that uh, I, I'm hearing basically three main things. One is that you focused iteratively, uh, iteratively, iteratively and incrementally in the sense that you started out with being like, okay, we're going to, uh, we're going to go into the legal field. You know, maybe we're going to start by doing all these different services. And then over time, it was like, okay, let's look at, uh, you know, what's working, what's not. It's like, this is where the profitability is. This is where we've built up the momentum, which is, I think, a, a really critical word here. And that's not to say that you weren't making any money at all through like design or through PPC or et cetera, but that you saw the opportunity to focus and therefore increase the momentum because the energy that you were putting going in this direction, that direction, et cetera, now all is going in the same focus direction, creating a much stronger push. And I think that's, you know, yeah, a lot of people think of niching as you're shutting out opportunity, but in reality, this was a, a huge, uh, op- this was the opportunity, right? This was an opportunity you took advantage of to increase your profitability. And uh, kind of number two that I'm hearing here that was really critical is that other people had opinions. You know, they were like, you could do this, you could do this. And you didn't do what you could do, or, you know, you went down those directions. Ultimately, you realize that even though you could go in those directions, that doesn't really mean you necessarily want to because the upfront work it took to build that same momentum there uh, ultimately was taking momentum away from your core focus. Is that kind of- 100%. One of the things that you said that I want to key in on is everyone says the phrase niching down. And when I think Mm -hmm. of niching down, I think of like a scarcity mindset. Like I have less, but when when I think of niching, I think of focusing forward. Yes. as like a yes. positive as like, Hey, I'm going to really serve this group of individuals, the best of my ability and really understand them. And yeah. it just has a, an extreme impact on everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, li- I like to think of it as, you know, who is the group of people that you can't ignore? You know, the people that you can serve so well, you can fix their problems so well, you know, them that 
you can, you don't want to ignore their needs, right? And sometimes you pick a group and you have to explore a little bit and, and you know, you clarify and focus down deeper, et cetera. But exactly what you're saying, it's really about, uh, less about the scarcity mentality of you're only serving these people and more like this is who you're reserving your best energy for because you have chosen to or observe that you can help them the most, essentially. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So this has been really good. You know, we, uh, and just, I guess one last thing on the topic of niching is that uh, I want to note that you niche down both within a vertical and within a service. And we were really afraid to niche down within a vertical at first. We kind of tried and we ended up niching down with the service of essentially copywriting and content strategy. Mm -hmm. But ultimately we also, like that's where we started, but we also ended up niching down uh, into more of a vertical, which is agency leaders. And that's not to say we don't serve other people, but just really that I think as entrepreneurs, we think we have to have all the answers up front and have it fixed and kind of solved and et cetera. And what I'm hearing from you and from our own experience is that it's okay to just pick a focus, go with that, you know, reassess, reorient instead of having to have it all perfect up front. Absolutely. You can always change it. You can always improve. What's the saying, get it done and get it right. I mean, there's so many different variations of this, that quote and that saying. Is what we say. Yep. Yep. Uh, Awesome. So let's move away from niching a little bit and more into your particular service that you offer, which is SEO. Mm -hmm. So understandably, you know, you do this for uh, just so people know the context, you do specialize in a very specific industry. But that being said, other agency leaders who are maybe dipping into the world of SEO or offering SEO, et cetera, what's the single biggest thing that you see other leaders basically doing wrong or missing? Mm, Jeez. From what aspect? Marketing, sales, operations? Like, what do you want to hit? Finance? Oh, um, uh, I mean, specifically within the, within the context of SEO. Um, but oh, I would okay. say if we're going to focus within that, like uh, managing expectations is a big thing that we hear super often uh, and just creating clarity and uh, results. Yeah. The biggest problem that most individuals have with SEO is they don't do enough. At the end of the mm-hmm. day, SEO is about production. Uh, okay. production yeah. from a capacity and quality standard. So if you're going to write one blog a month and expect that you're going to get on the first page of Google and you've got competitors that are doing substantially more, it doesn't matter if you do that for three years, you're never going to get mm. much traction. So mm-hmm. you have to do, you either have to do things differently or, or better or more. It, it, at the end of the day, it's particularly for personal injury. Let's take Chicago there. And this is just my niche. This could apply to any niche. For sure. Personal injury, there's hundreds of personal injury law firms. And they all have a car accident lawyer page. You know, one page might be 2,000 words. One might be 22. And at the end of the day, like, what are the activities that you're going to do to truly separate yourselves from the competition? It, It has to be different. It has to be more. It has to be better. And I think so many people try to just productize everything and just kind of do the basic, but, and maybe they're afraid of shooting the potential investment to the client of what it will actually take because they think they're going to lose the deal. But at the end of the day, you're going to lose the deal through churn anyways, and maybe even hurt your reputation. It's better to just say, this is what it's going to take. And if you're willing to do it, I'm willing to help you out. But if not, then here's someone else, you know, maybe they can do it cheaper. Mm. So what I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, in terms of what people are missing is number one, frequency and input in the sense that if you're not putting a certain amount of frequency and input, and we we get this all the time with people uh, who come to us for content creation, they're like, I want to start a blog or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, how long of your runway? What are you actually trying to accomplish? Let's work backwards. There's a lot more than just, you know, putting something out every once in a while. The other thing I'm hearing is, Uh, and correct me if I'm off here, is don't just focus on the check boxes of, okay, I've created an SEO page, I've done the thing. Don't forget about the audience and the value and the differentiation and writing good copy is what I'm hearing. That still differentiates you, makes a connection, et cetera. Yeah, let's just take content. Mm -hmm. Let's speak to the content, right? Yeah. So if you go and research an article and just do your your cookie cutter LSI, the common questions that individuals ask, and you write a little paragraph and you structure your page like that, if you're a service oriented business, everyone does that. 
Mm. So how are you different? Do you have unique statistics? Do you have a unique selling proposition? Do you have, what do you do that's different that helps you stand out? Because at the end of the day, the mobile device means we're all on the same street. Our lemonade stand mm -hmm. is all on the same street. Mm -hmm. So how is your stand? How is your business going to be different? It's no longer, oh, they're in this location or this. We're all in the same spot. And so you have to be different and better. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> someone who runs a copy agency, that's like music to my ears. Um, so I, I'm curious, you know, that that's the that's the kind of like practical value, something that people can really start to like think about. I'm curious in terms of your process, something that we hear a lot, you know, a lot of our listeners are, uh, you know, still getting organized on the operational side, let us just say. Um, and uh, I'm curious whether you have like a high level service framework. So this is understanding that each client is going to potentially be different, but like the five key steps of your process, I noticed that you do uh, several different types of SEO, uh, you know, are there are there five, five or less kind of key steps you tackle on every project? So just let's just take process in a general manner process. Mm -hmm. You want to do it. You want to document it. You want to delegate it. That's the biggest thing for growth and scale. And that's how you can, you know, elevate and delegate. That's how you can increase your capacity in terms of SEO and how we serve our clients. Mm -hmm. it, it, you can take SEO and you can take any type of activity and either increase or shorten your span of control. And what I mean by that is some SEO agencies will have SEO managers, SEO specialists, and they're the jack of all trades. They do, they do everything. They do your local SEO, they do your link building, and you can get a lot of capacity. They're doing all these different types of things, but it really makes it difficult to even in a uh, operations capacity to make someone a specialist. So at our agency, we actually really widen the span of control mm -hmm. and we have a content function. And that's the individuals that are ideating strategy, strategizing about content, what content we need to create, what content we need to improve. And then we have a section for on-site SEO, mm -hmm. making sure that content's optimized and, and we're internally linking, adding schema markup and all these different things. And then we have technical SEO. Some of the things that maybe those on-site SEO individuals can't do, they need to escalate to our technical department to do permanent 301 redirects and all of the really, the coding types of comp components, speeding up a site, compressing images, uh, all that kinds of things. And we have a local, someone that only does local Google Maps, citations, reviews, fights Google spam, optimized profiles, news directory citations. And then we also have a link building component and when you have a wider span of control, it's very difficult to do that if your contracts are low. Mm. There's just not enough profit and not enough margin built in to really offer that deep level of expertise mm -hmm. in the beginning. So it's, it's something that can occur later. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage, I think, just a natural progression of any agency owner is you have people that have to do more things. But as you get mm -hmm. bigger, you'll start getting expertise, uh, expertise functions and, and you'll build efficiencies in that manner. You have this kind of assembly line, whether it's a hierarchy or even a pod, it's the same type of situation. And that's what we do a little bit different. And that's why we have a, a better level of quality is because, hey, we have multiple functions underneath SEO. It's not just SEO manager, SEO specialist. Yes, and I love, this was one of my questions um, and you, you already answered it. I love how you broke down those different kind of buckets of SEO. Cause I know for myself as not an SEO specialist but working in copy where there's a ton of overlap. Um, this is something that is often confusing for the people that we work with. They're like, well, do you do SEO or how do you contribute to SEO? And SEO is such a big complex field that I love how you've broken it down to, you know, there's the content creation, then there's the on-site optimization, then there's the technical SEO stuff, then there's the local stuff. Uh, I might be missing one there, but those are all different aspects and elements that help someone be found on Google, let's say, or help someone be found online. 
but those actually require different skills. You know, like we don't have, uh, like the people on our team are experts at content creation that includes SEO and even uh, not all of them, but some of them in like on site optimization of that content. But if you're trying to get us to twiddle with images and stuff like that, that's just that's just a whole different category. Now, I'm curious, though, do you basically apply every one of these types of SEO on every project? Uh, or is it, you know, you kind of assess or, you know, they pay more for more different eyes on their thing or what does that kind of look like if you don't mind sharing? That's a really good question. So within each function is a different level of service. So under content, may, someone may just get, you know, blogs and pages where a higher level of contract may get those continuous upgrades to existing mm. content, or mm -hmm. maybe they get press releases. Um, underneath on-site SEO, we pretty much apply to everyone. But technical SEO, maybe we'll do an entire CMS conversion or and do an entire site architecture rebuild. Underneath local SEO, a different level of value, maybe the Google spam fighting. We're not mm. spam fighting for every location, but maybe we do in certain territories. And then under link, link building, there's a lot of different options. There are some links, those DR70s, those high authority links that are only available on a limited capacity. Like you get the opportunity to get a link from Wall Street Journal, you're not going to get 10 of those opportunities. You're going to get one. So who gets that? And there's just, so in every one of those functions, there's there's a different level of value that you can charge for, that you can offer your, your clients. Okay. Okay. I like that a lot. So uh, what I'm hearing is that essentially, maybe not 100% of the time, but yes, to some degree, each of these elements is tackled in every project. But how deep and how far you go in is basically governed by the needs of the project and the budget and those kind of logistical things. All right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's how we work as well. Essentially, we have like we we you know we love <laughs> we love you know just packages and modules and stuff like that. So we just basically have starter, influencer, and thought leader level for all of the different things that we do. And that might look differently for the different levels, but you're always getting some of each step, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and is there certain criteria that you use to assess uh, simply rather, you know, maybe somebody needs a little bit more or local SEO versus if someone really needs to lean into content creation? Yeah, good question. So we always do, we refer to ours as an SEO discovery because mm. lawyers do a discovery before they go to trial. Yeah. Um, but we do what we call a, a SEO discovery strategy and audit. So what we'll do is it's more than just a website audit, but we look mm -hmm. at the competition to set targets. We look at our prospects assets that they can have, that they have, that they can use as leverage. And then we just do a complete diagnostic before actually suggesting a, a campaign that would work for that particular prospect. And we've all heard the saying, you know, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that I say is, you know, imagine your car wasn't working properly and, you know, you drove it up to an auto body dealer and they come to their window, your window and they say, hey, that'd be $10,000 to fix your, fix your car. You'd be like, you're crazy. You didn't even look under the hood, right? Yeah. How yeah. do you even know what's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. That is what we're doing. We are looking mm -hmm. under the hood at your website, at your competition before we quote a plan. So I really think that that's critical. You have to do the the strategy up front before creating any type of action. Otherwise, you're just going to be treading, you know, you're on the hamster wheel forever. Yeah, absolutely. And how often, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that your services are available kind of on a recurring basis. How often do you revisit that strategy? Do you just kind of make it and then that kind of guides you? Do you look at it, you know, once a quarter, once a month, once a year? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So we're an EOS traction based agency and we look, we break everything down <laughs> you know, yearly goals into 90 day rocks and then weekly, weekly meetings. And we even break that down in the SEO department. So our clients have these goals. And in fact, one of our leading indicators we look at is an AA trust traffic value because rankings and Google analytics traffic at the end of the month, that's lagging. That's a lagging yeah. indicator. Like, what are you going to do at the end? But if you're looking at, at the numbers on a weekly basis and you see someone's traffic value drop from 400,000 down to 10,000, you've got problems. Like yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a good, maybe it's not the best metric in terms of highlighting that to a client, like giving them those numbers, but it, it mm -hmm. definitely sets alarm bells out for yourself 
to dig into something a little bit more quickly than just waiting for that monthly report to come out. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a personal thing that I have, which is kind of the difference between a dashboard and a scorecard and how you use those and et cetera. And what I'm hearing is that, you know, the initial strategy that you do gives you essentially a, a dashboard in the sense that it gives you a display of what the competition's doing, where the opportunities are, where you're gonna start, et cetera. But then you identify key metrics within that that will allow you, you know, this is not necessarily directly for the client, but you interpret it to the client, assumedly, et cetera to actually zero in and understand and those hopefully most people listening to this are aware of leading lagging indicators and what that means but essentially lagging indicator is something that tells you what has happened and the leading indicator tells you what is happening now early enough that you can affect it so i'm hearing that even though you do this kind of big strategy at the beginning you're setting goals quarterly and reassessing you're looking at those key leading numbers on a weekly basis so you can catch problems early on before they start to really snowball is that absolutely we do it from everything content we'll look at content to see if we're behind in terms of publishing and production we'll look at you know if there's too many out for um for approval you know because mm -hmm. that that will interrupt your throughput in terms of publishing that content yeah so there's all these types of com com numbers that we look at on a predictive leading basis Mm, yes, I love that. I, I feel like that's something I'm constantly working on doing better at, uh, especially since the growth strategies we do uh, are kind of across the map in terms of the specific strategy, depending who's working on it and stuff. And really, I think leading indicators across the board are one of the most powerful things that you can implement both internally and for your clients. Um, okay, so th this, this question... Uh, it's I'm going out on a bit of a limb so you can tell me how off base I am here but I notice that on your website the copy is very much about you know rank for popular keywords and stuff like that um versus when you dig what you actually give them is you know the content creation the on-site optimization the local seo etc so I'm kind of getting the impression that maybe you're selling them what they want but giving them what they need is that, am I on the right track there or did, was that just a coincidence? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I would say that, okay. you know, at the end of the day, we, we tell them, you know, we're trying to sell results. And in fact, on our proposals, and in fact, we don't even really do a proposal. We do the SEO discovery, then we obtain the conceptual agreement, then go into the, see it, you know, your statement of work type of situation. Mm -hmm. What we do is we're, we're basically telling them what that yeah telling them what they need in order to generate results uh, and and maybe i got maybe i was a little off by what you said maybe you caught me off guard there but um yeah that's why we have our minimum commitments that's why you know when we offer when we suggest a quote it's like hey you're in this we've done a discovery and you have this competition like here's the investment it's going to take in order for you to get results but yeah and the other thing is about the copy just digging into that and that's mm -hmm. That's really understanding your audience and who we want to work with and mm -hmm. from a very very deep level and mm -hmm. we know our avatar uh his name his uh what he likes to eat what he likes to do on the weekends his relationship status all of this type of thing and we can create content that really speaks to that individual and we worked with joel kletke uh he really helped us with our copy um from a sales standpoint but and he just did an excellent job and yeah, most of that was him. That was not us, but uh, I think he did a pretty solid job. Yeah, fair enough. I, I'm just nerding out. I'm just nerding out a little bit on the specifics. <laughs> I, now I'm like, oh, I want to get into it. I'm like, oh, your avatar, are they like symptom aware? Where are they on the stage of user awareness, et cetera? Won't get into that because that's a whole other podcast episode. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is that uh, and I'm going to kind of bring us full circle to the beginning as well, is that not only did you do the work to put in and create an in-depth avatar and then work with a professional to interpret that and write the copy, et cetera, but I perceive that being able to create that like depth of avatar is a function, in some ways it's a symptom of you having niched down and done the work and listened to their problems, et cetera. I think a lot of people, when they try to build avatars or personas, uh, a lot of these decisions around like, oh, we know what they ate, et cetera, become somewhat arbitrary because you're like, oh, we're going to put it down and almost like create this person. But mm -hmm. my experience of creating an avatar or a persona, which is a core, core thing of what we do here, is that you're more like trying to find the person. 
then create the person out of, out of scratch. You know, for me, you know, mm-hmm. you've built a good avatar when you do feel like you know them. You feel maybe you don't literally can't literally point to someone in your life that is that person. Often you can, uh, but you know, it's like you you feel like they're your cousin or something like that. Like you know them, and uh, I think that that you can't get that unless you niche down appropriately. That's my yeah. Answer. We we know yeah. them uh, the the word intimately without it, it. That is we really know them. Yeah. It's we know like what they're doing on the weekend. We know what they like to buy in terms of luxury, luxury goods, or, you know, what, what their hobbies are. And I got to be honest, most of our clients fit exactly in that avatar. And yeah. it's, it's like you said, <laughs> we, just, we found them. We didn't try to yes. create this. And then we, we already were, we're it's kind of like your core values. When everyone strives yeah. to core, core values, you've got co- some core values. And this is a little pet peeve. It's like table stakes. Like, Team player. Okay. Well, yeah. team player, like if you're not a team player, you're probably not going to work at that company very long, you know? Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> so like, but then there's other people try to attain a core value, mm. but core values are who you are. Yeah. So it's the same thing when you're creating your avatar. It's these people already exist. You're already yes. working with them. What is yes. similar about them? Yes. Yes. And I will straight up, like, I will talk to these people and talk about our avatar. (laughs) Like, you know, like, it's like, I feel like some people too, like are afraid to just be real with the people you're talking about. Like, I'm like, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is what we've learned. People like you, Jim, maybe you find it familiar, correct us if we're off and people love it. In my opinion, they're like, holy cow, you're right. You know me. Uh, And yeah, that's super powerful. And then I, I, you know, uh, last thing, then we'll move into the lightning round questions is that I do truly think that this opens a pathway of empathy as well, you know, where they become more than just a person on the page, you start to understand and care about their problems that allows you and the people on your team to deliver a better level of service without really doing much else. (laughs) Because you care, you genuinely care. Yeah, yeah, there's a and I'm trying, I'm going to turn into a huge geek here. I just watched Ender's Please Game, do. the uh, Harrison Ford version. I, I love the book. The movie is kind of so-and-so, but there's okay, a yeah, quote in there. The it's book. like, the moment I know how to destroy my enemy, I love them or something like that. It's like, mm. but it's kind of similar, similar thing. It's like, you know, you, when you understand your avatar, you know, like what they need to get the, you know, to get the results that they deserve and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So <laughs> All this avatar stuff, all this SEO stuff. I want to hear about you. What gets you Uh-oh. up in the morning? I am obsessed with learning. I think mm. there's all kinds of learners or earners. I I just, I would rather if I got to commute in the car, be listening to an audio book or a podcast compared to listen to the same song that I've heard 50,000 times. And I know that sounds a little too extreme, but I love kind of getting up early it's kind of a routine, pop on a podcast, drink some coffee, and I'm ready to go. But mm. um, I don't, some people like, how do you separate work and life? And I think that if you really love what you do, you don't, you don't have to separate those things. They're just who you are. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> There's a little bit more integration in my life sometimes just because what I love and what I do is in the computer world. And I live in a place where everyone works in trades and is very non-online. Mm-hmm. But you're right. Both of them are part of who I am. Uh, all right, Chris, what is the number one thing that you do to preserve your wellness? Oh, geez. I, so you hit me with that question before the interview and I was just, I've been sitting here thinking about this and this is the one I need to do better. Like I need, definitely need to do better. I need to work out more, eat better, all those types of things. My wife, Jenna is on me all the time, but, uh, I guess, geez, what's the number one thing? Get enough sleep. That's probably the one thing that I do well is I consistently get at least at least seven hours, pretty pretty routine. Um, yeah. If I don't have enough sleep, I'm just I just not I'm not productive at all. Mm. Yeah, I, I that cannot be overstated the importance of sleep. Like I've spent most of my life sleeping very well, and in the last year or two, I've developed insomnia where I would mm. love to get seven plus hours of sleep, but just. I just wake up six or seven times in the night. And let me tell you, if you have the capacity to sleep a full night's sleep, please, for me, if not for you, do it because it <laughs> makes such a big difference in terms of uh, your level of capacity, in my opinion. 
Um, all right. Are there any last are there any last words of wisdom that you would like anyone listening to this to walk away with today? I would say just if there was something that resonated with you, write it down and go do it. Yeah, again, bringing us full circle, action. <laughs> All right, Kiss, why don't you tell the audience, you know, if they'd like to find out more about you, about what you do, et cetera, where can they find you online? So the social media network that I'm most active on is LinkedIn and it's Chris Dreyer. You guys can find me on there, accept all invitations. And then if you want to check out my website, just go to rankings.io. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for giving me this time and sharing your expertise. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, yes, this was, this was really excellent. All right, guys, as always to our listeners, I hope you got some value out of this. I hope you feel inspired to take action. And I hope more than anything that you have an excellent freaking day today.